Hello. Yes, I played the clean version of that song. Let me make sure I get all this stuff off here so we can get going. All right. How are y'all? This is Interactive Book Club. So uh, somebody talk to me. How are you? Good. Thanks for doing this. Awesome. Well, let's jump in because we got a lot of content and I want to make sure this class is about the content. And uh, I just wanted to make sure, uh, introduce myself again. My name is Brett Caldwell. I'm the uh, interim OP until we get all the paperwork uh, signed, still delivered uh, by Pony Express to Keller Williams International in Austin and Pony Express back. But nonetheless, uh, I will be the OP going forward of the Heart of Atlanta group. Uh, and I'm excited. And today we're just going to talk about uh, the Millionaire Real Estate Investor book. Um, I think everybody either has had a copy or read it in the past or all that fun stuff. So here's the goal. This is not a class. This is a book club. So what we want to do is go through the book and we've broken it down. niale has got a schedule. Uh, she'll certainly put the schedule in the chat for us so you know kind of how we're going to go through the book, but we're going to go through the first 75 pages today. And I'm going to share my personal story, but I also want to hear from you guys. Uh, I realize that uh, everybody comes to this call at different places in their journey on where they're at in wealth building. And that and that's what makes this a, a rich conversation. So if Niali, if you'll share the screen and kind of start with our, our first slide here, I think this is really the, the setup of the whole conversation, right? And it's the uh, cash flow quadrant, which is actually from uh, the, actually, let's go that, there you go. Uh, it comes out of the uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad series by Robert Kiyosaki. Um, the second book that he wrote is called Cash Flow Quadrant, which is this quadrant right here. And let me just explain it to you real quick. So obviously the uh, top left is what, what an employee relationship looks like with money. And this is all about the relationship with money. So as an employee, uh, whoop, we went, there you go. Uh, as an employee, we work for somebody and we're working uh, in a W-2 type environment, which is uh, the tax document, if you will. And we get paid. We trade our time for money, right? And then by getting into real estate, which is our profession, uh, we kind of leave that behind in theory. And we go work for ourselves. And we decide we want to spend our time on our dreams and hopes and desires and we want to figure out a way to trade our time for money, uh, uh, chasing our dreams, right? Which is really what a self-employed person is, is uh, I'm tired of making somebody else rich. I'm tired of uh, helping build somebody else's dream. I want to go chase my dream. So I'm going to become a self-employed person. And there's a lot of uh, pros and cons. We don't have to get into all that. Um and then ultimately, you're trying to make your way over to the right side of this cash flow quadrant, which is where leverage shows up. And the business owner is leveraging uh, people and hiring talent and having models and systems and technology and people to uh, have that relationship with money around owning a business to where, uh, you know, we all have a limited resource called time. And at some point in time, I mean, some of us are really good about squeezing a lot of work into, into the time we have, but at, at the end of the day, we all have a limited resource there. And business is where you break out of that limitation of your personal time. And then ultimately, which is where we're going in this conversation is that investor quadrant, right? Where, how do I get money to make money for me? And uh, ultimately, that's where a lot of wealth is built 
and, and we're going to kind of talk about it, but I just wanted to kind of set our stage a little bit today around that fourth quadrant, uh, which is the millionaire real estate investor. So the cool part about what we're going to do with this book, call me Mr. Cliff Notes, if you will. So you, I, I used to joke with everybody and say, who's read the millionaire real estate agent book and everybody's supposed to raise their hand and we can even condition people to raise their hand. Uh, and, and I realized over the years, um, not everybody actually reads the book, but uh, if you commit to just being engaged in this process, we'll get you the cliff notes for the entire book. So it should be fun. All right, Niali. So let's jump into this. Uh, one of the comments, and I'm going to reference pages in the book as, as we're going on. I'm going to pop up some diagrams and we've got some stuff on, on, on the screen as well. But one of the comments right out the gate that uh, Gary Keller makes, he says, and you've heard this before, when the student's ready, the teacher will appear. And he's using that phrase in the context of your investment journey. So when you are ready to take a journey around investing in real estate, uh, the teacher will appear. And it may be me today. It may be the teacher that wrote this book. It could be uh, the teacher of writing any real estate investing book. Um, but the conversation is, is everybody comes from a different place in a different position. And ultimately when the teachers, I'm sorry, when the student is ready, the teacher appears, right? So fun there. All right, Niale, let's hit it. So obviously this is the book we're going to cover. Let's keep going. And Gary threw this definition out early in the book. And it's an interesting definition. And and until you understand it. And the definition is the unearned income to finance your life mission without having to work. And I got to be honest, the first time I read it, I was like, I don't know if I agree with that. How do, how do I make income that's unearned? Right? Like I, I got caught up on the unearned income word. And here's what I want you to understand about that word unearned substitute the word job. I have career income and then I have unearned income, which would be passive income streams, business income streams, investment income streams. And when financial wealth is when I have income coming to me that's outside of the job that I have, that income starts to finance my life mission without me having to work for it. So for instance, profit share is an unearned income. Yes, you helped refer somebody to our company. Um, but at the end of the day, I got a nice little check on the 21st of the month. And I'm not really sure I did any actual activity over the last 30 days to earn that check, right? Um, I, I did a lot of activity a long time ago for it, but it's actually an unearned income, although I feel like I earned it because I created it. Um, I didn't actively work for it over the last 30 days. Does that make sense? I think that's a really big concept to understand what investing really is. And um, one of the myths we're going to dive into uh, here in a little while is uh, talking about a lot of people have a belief that their job and the income they make from their job will make them wealthy. And, and it's not necessarily the, the case. And that's really kind of where unearned income comes in and, and, and plays a factor, right? So uh, there's a bunch of examples in the book on page, uh, it starts on page seven and kind of goes till page nine, where I, I'll just read one or two of them to you. It says, so uh, when Wendy Patton bought her first investment property, she was living in a hotel and made $20,000 a year and owed that much in student loans. Today, as Wendy has bought and sold more than 600 houses, she lectures around the country and lives off her investment income. Um, and, and I think Gary, when he wrote this book, certainly 
found some drastic examples to kind of make a point, right? Somebody that came from a place of no money and figured out a way to, to invest their way to financial wealth. Another one, um, Carlos Her Herbon, I'll probably mispronounce that, um, and his wife immigrated to the United States from Argentina with $150 in their pockets. The couple and their sons now own several million dollars worth of real estate and run a property management company. For them, the American dream has become a reality. Um, it's, it's, uh, there, there's countless stories of people from all different walks of life, all different financial resources, uh, and how they, they took this knowledge that we're going to dive into and created financial wealth for themselves. And I think it's a, it's just such a, um, powerful tool once you learn it, um, and apply it to your life. Yet, uh, what we're going to dive into today is a lot of the thinking behind it and, and what keeps us all kind of at ground zero, if you will, or, or from taking that leap of faith. Um, on page 11, one thing that I think is, is a, a really cool concept is he talks about money lives on the other side of fear. And if you've ever, um, have you ever heard the quote or the saying that says, your dreams lie just outside your comfort zone? or uh, our fears keep us inside our comfort zone because it's safe there, right? And uh, both those quotes and this, this comment he's making on page 11 around money lives on the other side of fear, uh, it, it speaks to the difference between people that go after financial wealth and people that um, uh, find ways to keep themselves in their comfort zone. Does that make sense? Any thoughts, questions? I would appreciate some interaction or it's going to be a lot of Brett talking for an hour. <laughs> that, um, that title, Money Lives on the Other Side of a, a Fear, I had actually just before you mentioned it, I took a picture of it and sent it, it to um, a group of friends. Um, because we've just been talking about that, about, you know, being able to not allow fear to dictate our decisions. Yeah, I love it. Thank you for sharing, by the way. Hey, Brett. One yeah. More I just wanted to say that, you know, I've done a few things on and uh, a few classes on investing, and it's a big uh, motivator for me to try and help people in my office uh, work their way towards wealth. Um, and, and the number one thing I hear from people is, is fear. I, I mean, that's, that's what tends to be holding people back. Sure, it may be money or other things that are involved, but at the end of the day, what it really lumps all into is, is fear and, and also the fear of unknown. You, you, you don't know until you've done it, um, and, and it's scary. So, yeah. You know, Thank you for saying that, John. You know, in the middle of page 11, Gary wrote in one of the chapters, he said, just like a river of water, fear can be bridged. Mm. Fear is only as big or as wide as we allow it to be. And, uh, you know, my I, I'm deathly afraid of snakes, right? And my wife's joke is, if, if I'm ever challenging her to do something out of her comfort zone, she always like, well, let's go put a snake around your neck and see, you know, but uh, I get it. Fear's a real emotion, right? Um, but as, uh, as our intellect and our intelligence can help our, our, uh, our, our way to create that bridge over that river, right? And, and attending classes like this and, and learning things is really uh, a first step to that, right? So this next slide, Niala, is uh, really kind of the purpose the book was written. It says, the millionaire real estate investor is dedicated to men and women who have a passion for their work and yet dream of someday achieving financial independence, of someday being able to finance their mission in life without having to work. This book is dedicated to all those who want the biggest life possible, who are actively seeking ways to finance that vision, who want to go as far as possible with as few roadblocks as possible and who want to say at the end of the day, 
I'm glad I did it instead of I wish I had. And I, I think it's, I, I felt like, man, should I put this slide in here or not? But it's such a purpose statement that I, I believe it speaks to a lot of us, right? Is we, you, you read, you read articles about the, the regrets of the dying and, and all that stuff. And, um, but the comment at the very end, I, I want to, at the end of the day, be glad I did instead of I wish I had. And, and I think I just want to uh, commend you guys for taking time to do this book club with us, because I think um, that speaks to your I'm glad I did mentality is, is you're showing up today to learn something. So congratulations to you. Here's the thing about this book. It's broken into two parts. The first part of the book is all about mindset and thinking. And then the second part of the book is about taking action and a plan. So we're going to be uh, in the first part of the book today and next week around Think a Million. I'm sorry, next month. And then we're going to move into action plan from there. So here's the concept of uh, models. And whoop, where are you going? One more. There we go. So we've talked in real estate forever about the power of systems and models and, and what that does in our life, right? So Gary, when he wrote the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book, interviewed all these millionaires. And if you think about it, like I take all this research, which I could throw the word chaos to, and through that research, I start to get some similarities. And at some point in time, I get what's called best practices. And that's really what models and systems are, right? Well, he did the same approach in this book. He took the chaos of 120 millionaire real estate investors and researched them. And that chaos came down to a funnel where this book is really the best practices how to go do that, right? So here's, uh, here's something you should know. Here's what the average millionaire real estate investor looks like. They own 50 rental properties and they have a $100,000 a year annual cash flow. So that's a model, right? Does that mean you have to have exactly that to be a millionaire real estate investor? No, because properties have different values and stuff like that. But when we're breaking something down to a best practice, that's what a best practice looks like, right? And, and ultimately, um, the way this chart looks is if I gave you no book, no information, um, you just started out saying, I'm going to figure it out on my own, you're going to have that trial and error uh, effort, which looks like on the bottom, which is a bunch of squiggly lines and banging your head against the wall and all that fun stuff. And um, I, I joke, but it'd be a little bit like uh, trying to invest in the stock market, not knowing anything, right? You're just, you're throwing darts at the stocks and you're going to have some good and some bad and that kind of thing. Well, the good news is, is we all come to the table already with a level of real estate uh, knowledge, right? So automatically, uh, I'm assuming everybody on this this Zoom call already has a model to understand how to value property, right? Not everybody has that model, um, but we are we automatically bring that to the to the the table, right? Um, but it also there's there's other models in how people engage into real estate investing, and we're going to kind of dive through that. But the purpose of this slide is for you to understand when you research something like this book, or even in your real estate career, if, if you understand the power of models, it speaks to the fact that somebody walked before us, or somebody uh, made all the mistakes and uh, figured out this is the best practice. And it, it gives us that fast forward. Uh, I remember it wasn't too long ago, uh, watching TV at our house was how fast could we fast forward through the commercials, right? To skip the, skip the next thing. Right. Um, or fast. My wife uh, doesn't like to watch the, the intro videos to the Netflix show. She likes to push the skip button, right? That's what a model does for our life. And in this context, real estate investing. 
you're pushing the skip button on, on the messy trial and error period and learning best practices and going straight to the models. What are you hearing me say? We don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? You know, I wrote down, I was uh, in, in the book and I'll let you read it. Gary talks about the first time uh, he almost bought uh, a real, uh, an investment property with his wife and it was a condo and all that stuff. And, um, and he didn't pull the trigger right away. And he decided a week later, he was going to pull the trigger and the agent kind of laughed at him and said, I told you it was a good deal. It was gone the next day kind of thing. Right. And so I wrote down uh, in my notes is what's your story? Because you realize I, I, I've got my story and I'll tell you here in a second, but our stories, a collection of our stories become the model for the next generation. Do you get that? And what we're reading is the collection of the stories of the generation before us. And that's what this book is, right? So my fun little story for my first investment property is I had a uh, friend of mine that was an agent and I was an agent as well. And I told him, I said, I want to buy my first rental property. And he said, well, I know these wholesalers. I'll see if I can find you some. And uh, I went out to California on a short vacation and I was sitting on a golf course uh, with a girl that I was dating at the time. We were playing golf in California and my buddy calls me. He says, I got a smoking deal on this property. Um, and uh, I think at the time it was like $65,000 or something. And uh, he said, but you got two hours to decide it's a wholesaler. And I, and I told him, I said, there, there's no way I can buy a piece of real estate that I've never walked into myself. I got to like see this house and I, uh, you know, the inner control freak comes out. And I ultimately I hung up the phone and told him I was going to pass on it. And, and the friend that I was playing golf with looked at me and said, well, you're kind of an idiot. You asked for this guy's ex expertise and professional opinion and he gave it to you. And you just basically told him you don't uh, respect his ex expertise and opinion. And I went, man, I can't believe you just said that to me. So anyway, I called him back and I said, well, what do I lose if I get back in town? And I decided I don't like this house. He said, you'll lose your thousand dollar earnest money. I said, okay, let's do it. I still own that house today. And it's, it's a incredible value in my portfolio. And uh, it's just one of those stories that's in my investment experience that hopefully uh, I can tell in, in, in a collection with your stories that creates a model for the next generation. But let's dive in and, and study the models of the generation before us. So, yeah, let, we, need, we need a cue, like, all right, <laughs> here we go. So uh, the foundation model of the real estate investor, if, you, if you've been around Gary Keller ever, um, he likes to use triangles and, and stair steps, and it creates that visual for us all to kind of understand. And um, if you'll back up just a little bit, Niali, uh, one slide. There, right there. So criteria. Criteria is um, one of the most important parts of the foundation of understanding how you're going to invest in real estate. And this starts on page, uh, oh, I lost it. Dun, dun, dun. I'm on page uh, 29 in the book. So criteria is what I would call your buy box. So if you've listened or paid attention to the real estate industry in any uh, time through the iBuyer uh, era, um, have you heard people talk about Zillow's buy box or Keller Offers buy box? Um, what a buy box is, is it says, this is my bread and butter criteria that I know I can make quick decisions from and I feel safe and I can pull the trigger and this is my mainstream 
uh, investment. And what Gary talks a lot about in this book is a lot of people, when they get into real estate investing, don't spend any time trying to create a buy box for themselves. They actually just go try to find something that they think is a good deal, right? And it's actually a mistake. Uh, you need to start with criteria and say, this is my buy box, whether it's a certain price range or uh, a certain rent to value ratio or whatever you want to put on your buy box, you need to take time to uh, put some thought here and create a buy box around what you want to look for from uh, a real estate deal. And basically he defines it as these are the standards that define what kind of property you're looking for. These are the things that you list when you're hunting for the next opportunity to invest in. Is it a single family, multifamily opportunity? What kind of amenities does it have? What's the location? All these factors kind of play into your criteria that you want to create for your buy box, right? So anybody on here uh, have a buy box that they, they could just kind of share what your criteria is that you look for in in investment real estate? Um, I, I, it's, uh, so for, for our rental purposes, you know, you, you hear people talk about cap rates and, and things like that. Um, a, a guy that I bought a portfolio from explained what he tried, what his model basically was was to try and purchase things at 50 times rents. Okay. If you could find things at 50 times rents. When you take into property management, taxes, everything else, that's, an, that's a solid, huge return on investment. Um, and so far that model has worked really well for me, especially in this one group of um, investments that I'm, I'm a part of with some other people um, in this one target area. Uh, it's not always possible to, to find that, but the cap rates on that, it takes out all the math. And sure. so you can find something 50 times rents, I'm buying it right now. Yep. There or finding go. somebody to buy it with me. It's the buy box, right? Yep. Thank you, John. Uh, my, mine was kind of, I wanted to, and it's changed a little bit since I used to buy quite a bit, but um, I wanted the rents to be as close to 1% of the value of the property. So if it was a $150,000 property, I wanted the rents to be as close to $1,500 as possible. Uh, I wanted it to be in an A-rated school district. And I also wanted the rent amounts to be competitive to what a two or three bedroom apartment was in the area. So I wanted people to make a choice to live in a house as opposed to paying the same amount of money for an apartment in that area. And, and, and that really was kind of, and I, of course I wanted a single family home and I had no garage conversions, that kind of thing, right? Um, but the, the more criteria you can put on it, uh, the faster you educate yourself on being able to pull the trigger on the deals because the truth is, especially in today's market, the deals are there but you have a really short window of time to, to take down that deal. Um, and if you don't have your criteria done ahead of time, you'll lose the deal in research trying to figure out if it's a good deal or not. And, but if you know it up front, um, you can pull the trigger fast and, and move on that transaction, right? Um, the other thing about criteria is it's predictable. So you all sell real estate, you know, the neighborhoods that if you walked into that neighborhood, you could say that standard home in that neighborhood is $300,000 and four bedroom with two car garage and blankety blank blank, right? Um, so what your buy box does or your criteria, it keeps you in a predictable value scenario. Other than that, you're just looking at the wild west of the MLS. Does that make sense? So you're wanting that predictability. That's what Zillow does. That's what Open Door does. They, 
remember, they're not even looking at the houses. They're just playing the predictability game because they know what uh, the buy boxes create from a predictability standpoint. Make sense? All right, so the next thing is terms. And terms uh, is really where the money's made in the deal, right? So terms is uh, the negotiable aspects of your investment, offer price, down payment, interest rates, occupancy day, closing cost, all that stuff. And really savvy investors know that they can get really great deals based on terms. So I want you to think about this. So um, if you had a elderly couple that uh, needed to sell their house to move forward in life, but uh, didn't want to let go of possession until uh, the end of the summer, um, you could actually, that term of allowing them to keep possession till the end of the summer could make you the A player in buying that investment property. And that's a term, right? And that's not necessarily money. That's uh, uh, a term or, or a criteria attached to that transaction. Interest rates, down payment, all that stuff. Um, you know, A paper uh, real estate investing is where most people start, but savvy investors quickly move to a more creative and alternative ways of financing real estate. So if I just walked into Chase Bank down the street and said I wanted to buy a $200,000 investment property, they're going to tell me this is the interest rate and you need to put 20 to 25% down, right? That's the A paper investment property scenario. And that's not necessarily a bad scenario. It's a safe loan. Um, and uh, it, it's a fair cost on the money. And ultimately, uh, I would have an equity play in my property uh, from day one, right? However, terms sometimes means I may partner with John Sherman because John Sherman has the money and I don't, but I'm going to do all the work and ultimately we're going to split the profits or ultimately I'm going to uh, trade my time for my equity in the deal where John Sherman's trading his money for the equity in the deal. And we create some kind of investment partnership, right? You definitely have that reverse, Brett. Yeah, yeah. But ultimately, I want you to understand when you're reading this book, terms determines what the real deals are, right? And then ultimately, the third piece of this is your network. And if you've ever studied any of Gary's triangles, um, the bottom of the triangle, and you can click on it, Neil, um, is really step one. Then the left of the triangle is step two. And the third uh, step is the tri part of the triangle on the right. So network is really your first step here. Then creating buy box is step number two. And then creating terms is step number three. The reason we talked about it in this order was because in order for you to get your head wrapped around becoming an investor, you got to understand criteria first. But just know building that network is what makes uh, the whole thing go round. So Gary talks uh, in the book about how uh, the network actually caught him by surprise. And here's what he means. He said, every one of the millionaire real estate investors that uh, they interviewed um, spoke to the power of their network. And here's what he means by the power of that network. It's probably the real estate agents that brought them the deals, the contractors that helped them with the deals, uh, the property managers that managed the deals, the wholesalers that brought them the deals. You know, there, there's a, a team of people that cause people to thrive when it comes to uh, real estate investing. And that network is really, really powerful. So what are you hearing me say? What I'm hearing is we're already part of our own network. We're the 
you know, real estate agent, that's one piece of it. Maybe even property management, if you know how to, you know, do that research. Um, so we've already, you know, started where some people above where some other people might have to start. Perfect. Somebody else. Yeah, we, we, we have the ability to create a real estate network, I feel a lot quicker than a lot of people do because our, our network already knows us in the world of real estate. So being able to educate people and say, it's not just about buying a home, look, look to see how real estate investing can you know, help your financial future. This is what I'm doing. Let's do it together. And you, and you essentially, I, I said this on a call recently, I don't really care for working with real estate investors myself, but I would love to turn my past client base into real estate investors. Yeah, absolutely. And you'd be in their network, right? Perfect. So really the criteria is identifying what's in the buy box. The, ter the, the terms are determining what the real deals are. And the network's all about the support structure you have around you uh, to cause this to be a, a, a thriving part of, of your business. So let's hit the next slide, Niela. The, um, this is the model. So obviously we talked about the three uh, criteria in terms of network. And step one of this model is really getting your head thinking around thinking. What is the thinking I need to get in place around how to uh, become a millionaire real estate investor? And, you know, I, I want to just pause for a second and remind you the word millionaire is used from a selling book term, not so much a uh, specific definition. However, um, in order to build a model, they chose that value of money to uh, create the model from, if that makes sense. So it may be your word and it may not be your word. Don't get hung up on it, but I use it in terms of context of being able to speak about it. So thinking a million, the next one is uh, obviously you got to buy a million dollars worth of real estate. And uh, when you do that, you got to figure out how to make that happen. What's your criteria? Uh, how are you going to create the, the, the financial ability to make that happen? Um, do you need partners? Do you need capital? Um, are you going to do it over a period of time? What's your plan around buying uh, the property? And then ultimately, you want to own the property, which is um, your, your plan around creating that equity. You know, I always share with people, if you can own 10 properties on 15 year notes, by the time you're uh, 50 years old, um, you've got that nest egg and, and cash flow stream uh, paid for free and clear by the time you're 65, right? And owning the real estate takes time. It's it, the, obviously the, the, you want to leverage the, the money and it just takes time to get to the finish line there. And then uh, the final one is receiving a million. So after you uh, play the, the game of putting the assets in play, paying them down, and then ultimately, how do we build this to where it funds our life? And that definition at the beginning of uh, unearned income creates financial wealth. So in order to do that, we're going to dive into thinking here for a minute. And Gary uses this term called myth understandings. And it's really a, uh, it's, it's a merge of the two words, uh, you know, having a myth and then uh, misunderstandings about your position. And on page 37, I think this is uh, kind of where we were talking about in the beginning. He talks about this, uh, the devil's wedge. And I've never heard this fable. I'm sure people have heard this fable, but um, he talks about the devil's best tool. And he says, the devil is going out of business, selling all the tools of his trade for sale or implements such as the hammer of hatred, the scythe of spite, the maul of malice, and the dagger of deceit. As one would expect, the devil's tools are all ominous, but oddly, the highest priced item in his arsenal 
is the extremely worn and harmless looking wedge. When asked why it's so expensive, the devil slowly smiles and replies, to be candid, this, ba this may be my most powerful weapon of all. I call it the wedge of doubt. And the wedge of doubt is what keeps most people inside their comfort zone or keeps most people uh, from taking that leap of faith or, or overcoming those fears, right? Um, and, and, it, it, and we all find our, our place, uh, ourselves in different journeys around experiencing that doubt. I shared that story with you. I, my, my doubt was how on earth could I buy a pro piece of property that I've never seen or walked into myself and ultimately um, I, I had somebody challenge me and, and, and I'm glad that they did, right? So that, that wedge of doubt shows up for all of us in different ways. And that's really what these myth understandings are. And the first three are basically our myths we have about ourselves. And these are called the personal myths. And then the last five or uh, myths that we have about the actual investment aspect of this. So the first one is, I don't need to be an investor. My job will take care of my financial wealth. And the truth about that is, yes, you do need to be an investor. Your job is not your financial wealth. And here is him speaking specifically to that definition of financial wealth is if I worked a, uh, a job making $100,000 a year and I'd stayed in that job for uh, 40 years, at the end of that uh, experience, I'm not necessarily going to be wealthy. And because the, the traditional uh, 401k, the traditional uh, uh, IRAs or the uh, social security or whatever you want it to do does not necessarily create financial wealth uh, in Gary's definition. And I'm gonna show a couple charts here real quick. Uh, Nelly, if you'll stop the share, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. All right. All right, can you see it? So on page 42, this is the figure two, and he's talking about people's net worth. And the bottom line, this dotted line is the income earner, right? So just by the fact that they have a paycheck of $100,000 a year, or let's go crazy and call it half a million dollars a year, like a, a, uh, uh, a doctor or somebody, right? Doesn't necessarily mean they have net worth. It just means their income earner goes across a line, right? And, and if you've ever heard us talk about career income versus passive in business, the point of an income earner or career income is once they go up and have that income level, the minute they stop working, they go back down to zero, right? So the net worth doesn't necessarily change just because of the income they receive from their job. So a modest investor obviously is going to have modest returns. And then a true investor has what we call a, a, a hockey stick um, uh effect to their, their investment. The second chart, which is on page 43, talks about cash flow. And you'll notice an income earner uh, on a cash flow game goes up, but as the cost of living goes up and lifestyle goes up, uh, their cash flow actually goes down over time later in their life, right? Where a true investor, the cash flows on an exponential incline, or a moderate in, or a modest investor, that cash flow tends to taper out a, as it goes through that course of time, and and ultimately, uh, what Gary's trying to uh, make a point about here is that just having a job, even if we were paid really, really well. Um, doesn't necessarily translate to financial wealth. Think of sports figures. Think of the next quarterback of the Atlanta Falcons coming in, making $20 million a year or whatever. 
it actually doesn't make them wealthy. It may make them rich because they have cash, but it doesn't necessarily translate to financial wealth, which we all know uh, you could throw the analogies of the lottery winners or high income earners and uh, they don't make great investments and ultimately they have no money at the end of it, right? We've heard the story time and time again because high income earning doesn't always translate to financial wealth where um, that's really what myth number one is. So it's all yours, Neil, if you want to share it again. Any thoughts on that before we move on to the next one? I think this is a really big one because uh, I don't know how many people I've talked to over the years. They're like, Ooh, I make $600,000 a year in GCI and I'm doing really good. But if you pull the curtain back, they don't really have much wealth. They just have a high uh, sales income. Does that make sense? <coughs> this is the interactive part. Nobody wants to talk. Last chance. Come on, somebody say something. Well, this all makes sense. I don't really know that I have much to add to it, but okay. reading it and, and listening to you talk, it makes sense to me. Perfect. Well, let's just jump to number two then. Number two is uh, I don't need to be or want to be financially wealthy. I'm happy with what I have. The truth is you need to open your eyes. You do need and want to be financially wealthy. Um, here's the thing uh, around this. I just wanted to read you the back and forth in the book. Um, the student uh, was talking to Gary. He said, you know, Gary, I hear you talk about building financial wealth. And I understand the logic of what you're saying. The problem with that is I'm not motivated by money. And I've heard this many times. Uh, I'm happy with what I have. I really don't need or want anything else. Life is going great just the way it is. And Gary's response is, fair enough. I truly appreciate your honesty and respect your answer. Now I'd like to ask you a question. Do you have insurance? Do you have any car, homeowner, disability, or medical insurance? Student says, sure, it's the prudent thing to do. Insurance takes care of the unplanned or unexpected, right? And Gary says, right. That's exactly the way I feel too. Things can happen that are beyond your control, and it's good to be prepared. My question for you, though, is this. How can you be sure that the unexpected won't happen in areas of your life that insurance won't take care of? He said, well, I'm not sure what you mean. He says, well, what happens if you suddenly lost your job or worse, your ability to earn a living? Honestly, I've never really thought about it. I guess you just don't expect things like that to happen. I have no idea what I'd do in that situation. And Gary said, I understand, but it is a real possibility and you, sh you really should think about it. And by the way, we're just talking about you. What if some sort of thing happened to someone you loved and that person wasn't financially prepared? You know, that scares me a little bit, the student said. They thought that a friend or family member might someday need my help and that I wouldn't be able to provide really saddens me. If they had health issues or experienced a financial disaster, I think I might feel very bad if it were not in a position to help in a meaningful way. And then Gary said, this is exactly what I'm talking about. So a lot of people find themselves at a place in life where they feel really comfortable and, and their needs are being met and taken care of. And uh, there's not a natural desire to uh, go big, if you will. Yet, if we pull, peel the onion back and, and really kind of understand that uh, we don't know what the future looks like. We don't know if uh, we're going to have health issues. We don't know if our loved ones will. And by pushing on this today puts you in a position to take care of your family and friends and yourself uh, in the future it is a very powerful thought process that a lot of people just aren't challenged to think around. And that's myth number two. Myth number three is it doesn't matter if I want or need it. I just can't do it. And the truth is you can't predict what you can or can't do until you try. Uh, ever heard that one before? Um, 
the uh, on page 51, uh, I circled the beginning of that chapter saying, I just don't understand why people seem to want to place judgment ahead of effort and unproven opinions before willingness to try. There's no way for you or anyone else for that matter to know your true financial potential. And I wrote, this is the key in, in, in the margin, meaning even if somebody in a leadership position uh, should never tell you what your dreams are, right? Nobody can tell you what your potential is. Only you can uh, dream of your potential and go for it, right? And think about that in terms of uh, building your financial wealth. Um, no, nobody can put a ceiling on that or a limit to that. And the one person in the world that certainly shouldn't put a ceiling or a limit to that is us, right? You, we, we can do it. We just get caught up in that doubt uh, thought process and, and it keeps us from being that. The other thing I wanted to uh, position is the two ways of seeing your potential on top of page 53. And it's the difference between probabilities and possibilities. So think of it this way. And uh, forgive me if I'm speaking out of turn around gambling, but I apologize ahead of time. Uh, I could have a possibility of winning the lottery. And if I live my life around the possibility of, of winning, um, it, it's a worldview, meaning what's conceivable. I possibly could win the lottery. I possibly could strike gold. I possibly could find that diamond in a rough flip property and make a hundred thousand dollars. And it's imaginable for me, right? You realize that is a thought process. However, a self view that, that I would advocate is probability. Meaning if I know my buy box, I know what my bread and butter is, and I play in that game long enough, the probability of me winning big in life is really high. And it, it, if back to my, my horrible gambling analogy, uh, think of uh, if you've ever watched poker games on TV and they show the people's hands uh, and it says, this guy's got a 26% probability of winning, and this guy's got a 74% probability of winning this hand. Well, we want to understand what probability means so that we're playing the game with the 74% probability of winning every time. Does that make sense? So uh, if you're getting your head caught up in, I can't do it, you're, you're allowing your thought process to hang out in possibility or impossibility. But if you can get your mind wrapped around, it's, a, it, it's something that I can do. It means you've taken the emotional out of it and you're playing a probability game. And uh, it, it's a powerful thought process. Make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yes. What what how do, what does that mean to you before I go on? I think that's a powerful thought. Uh for me, I feel like I think a lot about what's imaginable, but then I don't really go into depth and like think about the bread and butter of what like the process will be for me to actually achieve those dreams. So I feel like that would be um a good way for me to actually start thinking um in a more self-view type of way. Awesome. Somebody else. Thank you for sharing. Anyone, anyone, anyone? I don't know. I think. Oh, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, I think for me, what is powerful is that I used to think more along the lines of the possibility and not the probability. Um, but now I believe and I know I can do it. I don't have that fear of not being able to do it. Um, so that's powerful for me, just the shift in my own thinking around it. Absolutely. And it's really a business concept, right? Like uh, if you look at lead generation, your business, and you're like, well, if I buy 
this insert here technology piece or leads or whatever, I possibly could strike it rich. Or how do I probability look at the numbers and know this is a good investment? Make sense? It does. All right, perfect. All right, so those were the three personal myths and let's jump into the five myths around investing and then talk about where we go from here. So myth number four is investment is complicated, right? And uh, investing is only complicated as you make it. Sounds so easy, right? Um, on page 66, if I can find it, actually, hang on, before we get there, uh, oh, it's on page 61. There's a quote that Warren Buffett says, he says, you don't need to be a rocket scientist. Investing is not a game where the guy with the 160 IQ beats the guy with the 130 IQ. And I went, wow. So you're saying there's a chance, right? No, uh, it, it, investing is not a overly complicated formula that is reserved for the elite intelligence people in the world. Um, it, it is really something that almost anybody can do. And there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of stories of people that uh, didn't even graduate high school to uh, came from humble beginnings and uh, intellect was not necessarily what made them financially wealthy. It was just the fact that they went for it and they, uh, they increased their knowledge to remove the complicated thought around it. Make sense? So number uh, five is the best investments require knowledge most people don't have. So here we're talking about knowledge again. Your best investments will always be in areas you can or already understand. So this one's kind of fun because uh, it's really... <laughs> The if you understand uh, investing, um, what, what, here's here's what he talks about. He says one of the great le greatest lessons I learned about investing is that investing in what you don't know or understand isn't investing at all. So here's what he means in that statement: um, If I were to go invest in uh, pharmaceutical sales, which I know nothing about. I'm not really investing, am I? I'm just giving somebody money and kind of hoping and praying that it turns out okay. Or maybe I got a friend that's calling me saying, hey, I got the next best thing. You want to invest? Here's $20,000 or whatever. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm investing. It means uh, I'm, I'm giving my friend or uh, I'm giving an idea capital that I don't know anything about. But when you're investing in something you have knowledge around, um, it'll always be your best investments. We're in real estate. And that's kind of the beauty of us being in real estate is we see the properties before anyone else. We have the knowledge of how to uh, analyze them and value them. And ultimately, um, we're in the best driver's pilot seat position to move into financial wealth around real estate, but because of our knowledge. And, um, and then the next myth, number six, is all about it being too risky. I'll lose my money. So if you, I'm going to go back to the probability. Probability is uh, where the risk gets minimized, if that makes sense. So, um, your risk is, is a calculated thing. And in the book, he talks about how people bring the risk to the table. And I thought that was an interesting statement because, um, how do we bring the risk to the table? Well, I think what happens is, we're buying property outside of our buy box. We're uh, compromising the good terms that we know we need to hold on to to make it a great investment. 
um, I'd start buying property in a city that I don't know anything about uh, because I didn't, uh, I, somebody told me it was a good place to invest or something like that, right? So ultimately we're the ones that are making it risky, but if you stay in your bread and butter buy box with terms you know you can control and understand the probability of winning in that transaction, you minimize or ultimately re reduce the risk to where this is, this is a myth, right? And uh, it, it's just fun to think that, oh gosh, we bring the risk to the table. Um, okay. Uh, or I'm uh, putting money into something that uh, uh, I probably shouldn't be putting money into. And, and that's what, and then, then I'm going to blame it on that vehicle and say, oh, it was too risky. Right. So ultimately that's what risk is. Number seven is uh, successful investors are able to time the market. And uh, timing is one of the most misunderstood concepts in investing. And on page 66, I'd circled and highlighted this, and I thought this was an awesome quote. It said, in fly fishing, they say, you can't catch a fish with your hook that's in the air. And ultimately, that's true of timing the market too, meaning uh, you have to be in the market. And this speaks back to the criteria in the buy box. And in a conversation we had earlier is, uh, if you know what your buy box is and you know your predictability and your probability of winning and opportunity presents itself, you're prepared to buy on the spot where if you wait a day or you wait a week as Gary did, you'll lose that opportunity and uh, it's not available for you. The other thing is, it's kind of that roller coaster effect of um, we're always trying to buy, uh, buy low and sell high, right? But the truth is, is the market's typically on a long-term trend doing this. So if we buy smart on great terms, in our buy box, it's not really about timing the market. It's about buying it at a good buy and your money's made on the front end and sitting on it for 15 years, right? And the last myth of on here is all the good investments are taken. So every market has its share of good events or good uh, good investments is, is the, the final uh, truth here. And what he talks about is uh, those who take the best investments are those who best understand the conditions to create good investments. And there's economic conditions and there's personal ones. So most people think to buy a good investment property, I got to go into the MLS and find a house that's priced way under, or I got to go find a house that's dilapidated and I need to go in and fix it up. And that's what makes it a good investment. But there's a whole nother area of great investments that most people don't think about, which are estate sales, uh, death, uh, divorce, um, downsizing, foreclosures, things like that, that are personal circumstances that create good investment opportunities in every market. So ultimately, um, the, the good investments are taken are, are really somebody that's kind of halfway in the game. That's just probably trying to peruse the MLS or the market on, on an occasion, but the great investors know they're always out in the market looking for something and, and they know how to recognize the opportunity of what a good investment is. So ultimately that is uh, the eight uh, myth understandings of around um, the real estate. And then the last thing that I would throw at you before we broke today, um, Gary talks about the law of momentum on page 68 and 69. He talks about the snowball effect. And we've actually heard people uh, with financial advice talking about snowball effects over time. Um, one of which is usually like a Dave Ramsey concept of paying down your debt, right? You're, if you have credit card debt, you 
uh, pay the one with the highest interest rate and get it paid off and then apply the payment to the next one. And ultimately that snowball effect is how you reduce your debt load. But Gary says that snowball effect actually works in the investment world as well, but it's going uphill instead of downhill. And if you think about a house and uh, I buy a $200,000 house and it's on a, a 15 year mortgage. How much of the first year is interest? Sorry, you kind of broke up there. What was that, Brett? Oh, sorry. Am I been breaking up the whole time or just now? Oh, I'm saying that. So there's a snowball effect, right? Did you hear that part? So uh, obviously we pay down debt with the snowball effect, but our investment and our financial wealth has an uphill snowball effect too. And if you're, if I bought a $200,000 house and I was on a 15 year amortization loan, how much of that first year is going towards interest? Most of it. Almost all of it, right? But in the 15th year, how much of that money is going towards interest? Almost none of it. <laughs> Very little of it. So an amortized loan, just by definition, creates a snowball effect to your financial wealth, right? So the longer you sit in an amortized loan, the faster that snowball effect is happening in equity and wealth creation. And so the whole point of real estate as a law of momentum in financial wealth creation is, is that snowball effect, right? And, and it's an uphill snowball effect. All right, that was a lot. So that was the first 75 pages. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take um, Think a Million next month. And like I said, I, uh, it's a book club. So I'm, 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 I hope you don't feel like it's so much a class as it is we're just going through the book together, right? And I want you to have the cliff notes. And certainly if you do not have a copy of this book, uh, I would like to know that and, and email Niale or whatever. Um, my email is bcaldwell at kw.com. But uh, your commitment to going through this journey with us is awesome. Thank you all for your time today. Any last thoughts, questions? I talked a lot. I just wanted to say, Brett, yeah, thanks for doing this. And, uh, you know, that snowball effect, to me, that's where the real magic happens. Um, you know, really, you that first investment property, you start to see it. But once you have maybe two or three, and you're, you get one of those paid down or almost paid off, that's where it really starts rolling downhill quickly. Um, and, you know, you're, you're basically buying properties and using the others to pay for it. Uh, and so yep. that, that's the real snowball that to me is the magic of it. So love it. All right, guys, y'all have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Thank you.